All right. As always, for those who are watching, I always try to have conversations with people of different faiths. And the reason I do it is to try to um, un clear up the muddiness of a lot of these discussions where we talk past each other and um, where we don't understand each other. There's no point of having a attempting to have a genuine conversation if you don't at least understand uh, the position of the other person. So, as always, I'm not here to debate. I'm not even here to challenge, as I've done in every previous one. I'm going to ask questions people want to know and then let the other person respond. And today, I'm having a conversation with a Muslim. So, you know, without further ado, I don't know how to produce. I don't, I don't know how to say your last name. So <laughs> I will let you introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks for having me on, Bryson. Uh, my name is Daniel. It's yeah, it's very hard to pronounce. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's a Persian last name, Iranian. Okay. Uh, my parents are immigrants from Iran. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I uh, lived in the U.S. my whole life. Um, study, went to public school here in Houston, uh, went to Boston for college, went to Harvard University, studied physics and philosophy as well. I'm not a convert. Uh, I might have a slight Texas accent, but I'm actually uh, been Muslim my whole life. And yeah, I have a um, website, muslimskeptic.com, YouTube channel. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, etc. And I've dedicated my life basically to teach about Islam, um, you know, address misconceptions about Islam and also uh, critic critique and analyze some of the modern trends and philosophies that I feel are attacking not only Islam, but are attacking traditional religions and God and the idea of God and be, the idea of being a religious person. And this is something like a broader phenomenon that affects um, everyone. And I know that's something that you address a lot in, in your stuff. So yeah, I, I, that's a short intro to me. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, the first question I want to ask is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are two different types of Muslims. We have Sunni Muslims and Shia. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Muslims. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is due to a disagreement about the bloodline and things of that nature. Could you explain that? Well, which one are you? And explain the difference, please, if you can. Sure. That's a great question. Uh, so I'm Sunni. That's the majority um, 90 percent uh, are of Muslims are Sunni and then there are Shia and actually most Shia are in Iran. So I'm from a Shia background and then I became Sunni. And the difference is it, it was a political disagreement that happened after the passing, the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, who, who would succeed uh, in terms of political power. Um, and that's uh, basically within the first generation or two, you had a sect or a group that was insisting on one person being the successor um, and, and ruling. So it was a political disagreement. Later on, it became more of a theological disagreement. Um, so Shia beliefs, they have a slightly different theology um, from Sunnis. They believe that there are these infallible imams. Um, 12 fallible, infallible imams who come after the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And they bring, you know, they, they're infallible. So it's like they have revelation um, and they continue revelation after the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So uh, obviously this is rejected in Sunni Islam. Um, prophet Muhammad was the final prophet uh, to bring revelation with the Quran. And there's no one who is infallible. Um, and you know, with that kind of role as a messenger after him. So that's like a, in a nutshell, like the difference between Sunni and Shia. And do the, the, the two different sects get along? Cause as you know, in Christianity, we have a lot of them and all, we all argue with each other. So, 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 so yeah. do, do the two, uh, I guess I'm gonna call them six. Do, do they get along with each other? Is it, is it typically peaceful? Uh, there's been different like points in history where uh, there's been a lot more conflict. Um, recently, also, there's been more conflict, but I think a lot of the conflict nowadays is generated in order to really cause geopolitical conflict. 
in the Middle East because you have Iran. Um, that, that's a very powerful country within the Middle East and a, opponent to a certain you know, country, uh, Israel. And one of the strategies that Israel has used is to divide and conquer, basically. So I think a lot of the, I'm not saying that without Israel, there would be no tension or no conflict between Sunni and Shia, but a lot has been inflamed uh, in the past, you know, let's say since 1979, uh, a lot of inflammation of conflict because of the Zionist state and what they want to do in the Middle East. All right, now time to the them some two questions that I actually wanted to know myself. So, you know, now let's get to the questions people want to know. We're going to jump right into it. You already know what the quest the first question is going to be about. Um the first question is I sort of know the answer, but it may differ between the different Muslim sects. Um do you believe Jesus is just a prophet or do you also believe that Jesus is a anointed one or in other words the Messiah or a Messiah? And that's the first question. Yeah, Muslims believe, and I don't believe there's any difference between Sunni and Shia on this, that Jesus, peace be upon him, is the Messiah, and he's a prophet as well. So Messiah, meaning the anointed one in Arabic, it's Messiah. And basically, uh, you know, we believe that uh, he was not crucified um, and that God saved him uh, from crucif crucifixion and lifted him to... Uh, heaven, and then he's going to return uh, to kill the Antichrist and to save humanity, and that's uh, part of his role as the, as the Messiah. But yeah, he's a he's a prophet. Okay. Um. Also, I I, I knew that Muslims believe Chris, um, that Muslims believe Jesus was the Messiah, but Christians never believe me when I tell them this. Um. The the second thing though, you you said interesting is two things I want to touch on. Um, the one you say you do not believe that he is a, he was crucified on the cross, but you believe in the event happening. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and this is mentioned in the Quran um, that uh, someone that was made to be to look like Jesus. So the people are trying to uh, kill the Messiah. And but God intervenes in this is kind of miraculous way and saves him from crucifixion and preserves him and then he'll he'll return um uh, in the end of days basically and yeah but he's like a prophet so muslims believe in uh prophets like noah abraham uh moses david solomon uh jesus as a prophet and then the final prophet is muhammad peace be upon them all and the idea of a prophet is as a guide for humanity they bring revelation um, so there's been a series of revelations, uh, such as the Torah, uh, what's called the Injil, which was sent with Jesus, peace be upon him. And these revelations are meant as guidance, but they can be corrupted or they can be changed. Like people will have an interest in changing the word of God and claiming, oh, this is from God, when in fact, it's just what they've tampered with. And so the final revelation is the Quran that came with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that's the final prophet um, and the, with the final revelation. Okay. Um. Also, you said that um, you believe Jesus is coming back. That was going to be one of the questions because a lot of Christians don't even uh, understand that Muslims believe that also. Uh, but you said he's coming to destroy the Antichrist. My question is, is there anything in the Quran that indicates who the Antichrist is or what the Antichrist is? Or is there a consensus consensus amongst muslims of who they believe the antichrist to be yeah so there isn't anything explicitly in the quran itself but there are a lot of statements of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him about who the antichrist is and uh descriptions of him basically so one of the main descriptions of the antichrist is that he has like a defective eye or he's blind in one eye and he only has one eye and that's an interesting uh, thing about the Antichrist. And a lot of people will notice that one eye symbolism is everywhere, right? Uh, it's on the dollar bill, like this image of the eye. Um, it's an interesting symbol that we see recurring in popular culture today. But one of the main indications of the Antichrist is that he is one eyed, like he has a defective eye. 
And the thing about the Antichrist is that he's going to at first claim that he is like a messenger from God. And then eventually he's going to claim to be God uh, and uh, to be like the promised Messiah and God himself. Um, and that's what makes him the Antichrist is that he is because uh, the Arabic word for the Antichrist is Dajjal, which means to deceive, like the arch deceiver. And the arch deceiver is going to deceive people by making himself look like he is the Messiah. Uh, and and this is going to be and, and he'll have like certain powers that uh, that he can trick people with and fool people into thinking that, oh, this guy is really like a either like a Messiah or he's like God. And that's how he will get people to follow him when in reality he's leading them to idol worship and Satanism basically. So that's, so there are many descriptions about the kinds of things that the Antichrist will do, but ultimately uh, Jesus Christ is going to come literally from heaven uh, in Damascus. So the place where this is going to happen, it's going to come be and, and be brought down from heaven with two angels carrying him. And then he will literally kill the Antichrist. Thank you. Um, also in Islam, how do you get to heaven? Like on judgment day, first off, do Muslims believe in, I'm sure y'all believe in a judgment day happening, correct? Yes. Okay. And what would that judgment day consist of? Like, what, how are people being judged? How do you get to heaven? Uh, and also, what is heaven and what is hell in uh, the religion of Islam? Yeah, so there is a day of judgment, and you have to believe in the day of judgment to be a Muslim. Uh, so the day of judgment is something that will occur and no one knows the day that it'll occur except God, uh, except Allah. And that day people will be judged, uh, on their faith and on their acts, you know, um, to put in slightly Christian terms, but the idea of faith is you have to believe in God. You have to believe in Allah and you have to believe in his prophets uh, with Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him, as the final prophet. So that that is a part of belief. You have to have basically the uh, testification of faith, which is there's no God except Allah. Um, he has no partners. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger of all these other messengers that have come throughout time. And so that's the faith part of it. That's the faith part. So that's a prerequisite. And then um, also acts or, or deeds. So you have to have good deeds. You have to pray fast. You have to um, give charity. You have to um, do pilgrimage if you can once in your life. These are known as the pillars of Islam, like the five pillars, if you've heard of that. Um, so a person could uh, be negligent. Like you could be a Muslim who's negligent, like, oh, you don't necessarily pray or you have missed a fast or things like that. Um, so these are considered sins, like these are grave sins, but they're sins that God can ultimately forgive you for, like God will forgive um, as long as you don't try to change the religion and say, oh, I don't pray because I don't need to pray the five prayers. Like That's not something that is required of Muslims. If you say that, then you're you're trying to mess with Islam. You're trying to change Islam. And that threatens your uh, faith. And therefore, like you could actually leave the fold of Islam and that will threaten your afterlife. Um, so but going back to your question, heaven and hell, these are physical places. These are cr places that God has created already. Um, and heaven is filled with all kinds of delight and pleasure and everlasting peace. Um, so this is, you know, this is the par this is paradise and you'll be with your family. You'll be with your friends. You'll be with uh, believers. And then, and, and the prophets, and then hellfire is, you know, fire and brimstone. It's torture, it's pain, it's suffering um, in, a, in a real way. It's not metaphorical. So that's, that's heaven and hell in Islam in a nutshell. Okay. And that will lead to my next question. Cause one of the other um, stark differences that causes a lot of division between Christians and Muslims um, outside of the, of Jesus dying on the cross uh, the next one is um, a lot of Christians believe that they don't believe in. Matter of fact, I don't think any Christian believe in uh, the Prophet Muhammad. So would that keep most Christians um, out of out of heaven because they don't believe in all the prophets? 
yeah, that would keep someone out of heaven if they they know about Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they reject Muhammad. Because the idea is that Muhammad is just like the prophets that have been mentioned, um, you know, in the Bible. Um, he is uh, a messenger. He's coming with the law. He's coming with um, this entire um, system of religious practice and guidance. He's coming with revelation. And when you read the Quran, it's, you know, you can tell that this is from God. Like this is someone who is like very, uh, you know, well-tuned with, for example, the Old Testament or the Torah specifically. And they read the Quran, like many people have converted to Islam on this basis. Like, wow, when I read the Quran, it's, it's like, I, this is from God. Um, it's just, it's like, it's from God. It's like, not from the words of a, of a person who has written this or an author. It's not like literature. Um, so if a Christian or a Jew hears about Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him, and then doesn't research him and doesn't, you know, see and recognize that, okay, this is, this is a prophet, just like Moses was a prophet, just like Abraham was a prophet, just like these other prophets that we know and believe in. Um, then that is a rejection that is kind of like an arrogant rejection of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, yeah, that threatens your afterlife. Thank you. Um, also, uh, another thing is uh, that Christians, and I'm included in this, we believe that Jesus is the son of God, the, the only begotten son of God. Um, and I understand that Muslims clearly don't subscribe to that, but also y'all think it's uh, in a metaphorical way, correct? Just, just go ahead. Answer. You can answer. Yeah. No, we don't believe that it's me metaphorical. Uh, God uh, doesn't have a son, even in a metaphorical way. We believe that Jesus was a virgin. Uh, I mean, uh, um, from a virgin birth, um, and that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a virgin, um, and that Jesus's birth was miraculous. That he's the Messiah, but not that he is the son of God. Uh, in the same way that Adam. Uh, the first man is not the son of God, even though Adam didn't have a father or mother. He's just a special creation of, of God. In the same way, Jesus, he has a mother, but he doesn't have a father. So he's a special creation, but that doesn't mean that he is uh, the son of God, even in a metaphorical way. Okay, now uh, to another sect of questions. So in Christianity, this is a question for this question is my, one of my questions. <laughs> Uh, Christianity, uh, and this is something that I disagree with, uh, a lot of Christians take pride in calling themselves sinners and saying things like they sin every day. And uh, biblically, this just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and when I was writing down questions for 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 you, I wanted to know, do, do, does Islam feel that way too? Do, do you believe it is impossible for any human to be righteous? And do you believe, the, do Muslims believe that they will always be sinners and, uh, and do y'all identify with the term of being a sinner or being a, I don't know what, what else you want to call it. Well, it's not that we're proud of, of sin. Sin is something that's unavoidable for human beings. And uh, this is actually one of the statements of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that um, God created us the way that we're, we are, that we sin. There are other creations that don't disobey God, like angels, for example. Angels just do exactly what they're commanded by God. They don't disobey God, so they don't really sin. But human beings do sin, and God made us in this particular way where we sin so that we may turn back to God and ask for forgiveness. And that's a beautiful connection that we have as human beings uh, to God. So the fact that we are sinners, the only people who are saved from sin are the prophets, um, they're the ones who are sinless and they're the ultimate role model, but we, as human beings, we're sinning. And that doesn't mean that we're proud of it. Like that's just a reality, but that just means that we have to turn back to God and ask for forgiveness. And in Islam, like we have a direct connection, like we ask God directly. We don't have like any intermediary where we say, oh, I have to confess to a, a man. And then that man, like a priest will would forgive me. No, we just ask God directly for forgiveness. And then he forgives us because, and that's something that God loves to do. Allah loves to forgive us uh, when we turn to him and, and sincerely and, and recognize that we are um, fallible. We make mistakes. Even major sins can be forgiven. Even someone who uh, has 
committed murder or committed adultery or committed theft, some of these major mortal sins can still turn to God and ask for forgiveness and be forgiven by God. So that's, but are we proud of the sin? No. And this is something that Muslims, we should not advertise our sins. Like this is, uh, if we advertise our sins, it's like normalizing it. You're normalizing the sin because you're saying, oh yeah, I, you know, did this wrong action. I did this sin. So what? It, that's norm. Even if you call it a sin, you're still normalizing it by talking about it in this kind of way. Rather, you should hide your sins and ask for forgiveness privately rather than advertise it and indirectly normalize it. So my question would be, um, as a follow up question, earlier you said people will be judged by their faith in their deeds, which is also uh, in the Bible that I read. Uh, but my follow up question would be. How do you make the distinction between you and somebody that's going to hell if sin is unavoidable? Um, is it solely based on believing in all the prophets or how do you make that distinction? Well, it's ultimately up to God to decide. So the prerequisite is the faith part, which in Arabic is Iman. But you could be someone could be like a major sinner and their sins, like in according to like one statement of the prophet, peace be upon him. Someone comes in front of God Almighty and his sins are like a mountain of sins. Uh, but he had such strong faith and belief in God and did not associate any partners with God. Um, that faith was so pure that that God forgives all of those sins, the mountains of sins on the basis of that pure faith. So the faith is really the most important part of it. Then sins, it's then it's up to Allah to decide uh, whether to forgive a person or not, because we're all going to go in front of Allah with all kinds of sins. Uh, but we have hope like that's the th that's the state of a believer. Uh, a Muslim is between hope and faith. We have hope that God is going to forgive us. Allah is going to forgive us on the day of judgment. But we also fear that, well, what if? He doesn't because I'm just a bad person. Like I am scared of hell. I am scared of displeasing God. I'm, I'm afraid that God won't love me. So I'm going to uh, ask for forgiveness. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to have that level of humbleness that I ask for forgiveness. I don't walk on the earth like I'm arrogant and who, who can judge me? Uh, no, God can judge me and I'm a, I have that fear. So the, the Muslim is always between hope and fear. Uh, and that's where the hope is very important because it's also not a good state to be in where you're constantly uh, depressed or you've lost faith in God or you've lost hope in God because, oh, God will never forgive me. I'm too bad. I'm too evil. That's like one of the tricks of the devil, of, of Satan in, in Arabic, shaitan. Like Satan wants you to become... Uh, basically uh, depressed and have no hope in God. That's what Satan wants so that you don't turn back to God, that you don't ask for forgiveness, that you don't, you know, submit to God and be humble to God. God wants, uh, Satan wants you to be uh, despondent and depressed and hopeless. So both, you have to have that balance. Last follow-up question to that. Um, and you can literally be honest, bro. I am <laughs> not sensitive at all. Just be honest. Do not. I don't like sugarcoat. Um, so just just as a question, me, I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus died and rose again. I believe he's the son of God. Yada, yada, yada. I don't murder. Let's say I don't I don't murder. I don't have sex out of wedlock. I don't watch porn. I don't really think like I live. I live a righteous life, but I don't believe in Muhammad. Would I have a better chance or a lesser chance of making it into heaven versus a Muslim who is a murderer, um, who commits adultery. Um, and this is a consistent thing he does throughout his entire life, but he believes in all the prophets, including um, Muhammad. Would he have a better chance to make it into heaven than I would? As long as he doesn't believe that what he's doing is acceptable, like murder and adultery, like those are acceptable things. If he recognizes he know, He that. knows it's wrong. He just, in his mind, he can't stop doing it. Yeah, he would have a better chance because he has uh, belief. He believes in the last prophet, so he has iman. Um, the iman is like the key uh, 
faith is like the key to heaven. Um, and then your deeds are like the teeth of the key, you know, that will open it, open the gate of gates of heaven, but you have to have the, the faith. So if someone rejects Muhammad, then it doesn't really matter if you have all these good deeds, you've rejected the final prophet and the final revelation. So that's, uh, that's very serious. Okay. Uh, on to more questions. Uh, this question is, um, uh, somebody insinuated it to me in DM and I thought it was a good question because I've wondered this also. Uh, so in the Quran, it, it does at least imply that Muslims have to follow the Torah and the Gospels. Uh, and multiple, okay, I think is chapter 56. I might be wrong. I haven't, I haven't looked it up in a while. Um, mm. But yeah, it says you have to uh, follow the Torah and the Gospels. Uh, and my question is why don't Muslims follow uh, the Torah and the Gospels? Uh, well, we have to look at the verse specifically. Um, when you look at different verses of the Quran, um, it will refer to the Torah and the Injil, which is not necessarily the Gospels. Um, what is the actual Injil? Um, it seems to be something that has been lost because the Injil is the revelation that was given to Jesus Christ and it's his word so it'd be it would be something that in his language would be aramaic just like the torah is in hebrew uh, but there is no aramaic scripture that's been preserved um the gospels were originally in the greek language so that's not the language of jesus christ um but so the the quran will mention the torah and the injil uh, maybe gospel is not the best uh word for that as a translation but there are many other verses in the Quran that talk about how the uh, Torah and the, and the Injil have been corrupted, that Jews and Christians have corrupted their books. Um, so this is there's an acknowledgement that, yeah, in what the Christians and Jews follow today, there is some truth in it. Um, but it does. But there is also corruption. So it's not a full endorsement of the previous scripture and it's not a full rejection. Muslims believe in the Torah and the Injil um, as revelation from God and these other prophets. Uh, but that doesn't mean that what Jews and Christians practice today in their various sects are a true representation of what was originally revealed. By, by the way, I had the I had a chapter on it, it's chapter five, uh, verse 68 and five, five forty four. And it said the to it says a Torah is a guidance and light. So that's so that's what it says. And my my follow-up mm -hmm. question would be, um, yeah. The, and, so the Torah originally as sent was a guidance and light, in the same way that now the Quran is the guidance and light. But the problem is that the Torah was corrupted, uh, and this is referred to in in the New Testament as well. Jeremiah eight verse eight, I believe. Um, refers to scribes that handled the scripture falsely and lied. Um, so this is a this is what the Quran also refers to that scribes and and preachers uh, will corrupt or can corrupt the word of God. And uh, this this is what necessitated a final revelation in the Quran. Uh, Jeremiah is the Tanakh, so it's still Old Testament. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Are you okay? I don't, I don't, I don't like calling it Old Testament because I don't, I don't. I, I'm, I'm a Torah keeping Christian, so. Uh, but so my my question would be though, um, how corrupt? And uh, there's two of my two two questions that I really don't know, so you could you could just answer it. If I'm not mistaken, I know Muslims don't eat pork, but if I'm not mistaken, y'all eat shellfish or something that's that's that, that's that's called unclean in the Torah that Muslims eat. And do Muslims keep Sabbath, or do you think? That was an add-on to unclean foods, or do you think that was a man-made thing? So that that would be my next question. Uh, no, the Sabbath is not a man-made thing. It's uh, one of the things that God revealed, and we know this because it says it clearly clearly in the Quran that the people of Israel were commanded to keep the Sabbath, um, but they violated the Sabbath, um, and this became a source of punishment from God because of their violation of the Sabbath. Um, so that's not a man-made thing, but it's something that has been abrogated, basically, like Muslims or, or uh, humanity is not obligated to follow the Sabbath any longer. There's a there's a new law uh, that replaces the Mosaic law. Uh, this is Islamic law, the Sharia, 
So there'll be many, there are many parallels between the Mosaic law and the Sharia. And this is, you know, this is something that Moses uh, claimed in Deuteronomy 1815 um, in the Septuagint, um, you know, the, the Greek uh, the Tanakh translation of the Tanakh. Moses states, the Lord thy God shall raise up to thee a prophet of thy brethren. Like me shall ye hear. So Moses himself is talking about a prophet uh, of thy brethren. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is from the line of Ishmael that goes back to Abraham. So Abraham, of course, had Isaac and he had Ishmael. And all the prophets mentioned uh, in the uh, Old Testament and then up to Jesus are uh, from the line of Isaac. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, is from the line, the progeny, uh, the lineage of Ishmael. Um, so Muhammad does fulfill this uh, prophecy of Moses. And when you compare the life of Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, you see all of these parallels. Uh, like they, they both are uh, leading their people. Um, they are both uh, very successful in, in terms of politically, in terms of being able to conquer lands, in terms of bringing a law, in terms of the kinds of rituals that they prescribe when it comes to fasting and prayer and uh, even animal sacrifice. Um, many of the norms and values are shared between Mosaic law and Islamic law uh, when it comes to like sexual modesty, uh, punishments for blasphemy, punishments for sexual indecency, uh, banning usury, uh, banning things like interest, banning things like uh, eating pork, dietary restrictions, all of these parallels between Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them. When it comes to shell, the shellfish issue, there's actually a difference of opinion amongst Muslims, like Sunni Muslims. Um, some say that uh, shellfish should not be eaten uh, it's uh, impermissible and others say that you can uh, but yeah that's on the shellfish issue thank you um one more this is sort of like a softer question this is this next question is one for me then we're gonna get to some of the stuff that i'm, I'm gonna just ask you so um what is the muslim's version or what is the version of islam in the creation story is it similar to what it is in christianity god created the earth uh, six days arrested on the seventh, or what is the creation story uh, in the Quran? Uh, yeah, so we don't believe that God needs to rest, but um, there being uh, periods of creation, not necessarily days, uh, but creation being created uh, in six days, that is also in Islam. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the detail specifically was what was created when. Um, it's not laid out in the same way that Genesis is laid out, uh, but there are a lot of parallels. Uh, also, creation of Adam, uh, peace be upon him, and then his spouse being made from his rib. Um, that's also shared, them being in the garden, uh, basically in paradise, and then them being commanded by God not to approach a specific tree. Um, and then they are deceived by Satan. And Satan is, we don't believe that he's a fallen angel. We uh, maintain that Satan is um, a different creation than angels. So angels are made of light, but Satan um, is made of, uh, is, is a different creation called jinn. I don't know if you've heard of in popular culture that's like genies, like the idea of a genie, like in Aladdin, like that's the story of uh, a genie, meaning a jinn, like it's a smoke uh, made of smokeless fire, this creation. And the jinn can be good or they can be bad. Uh, but the the father of all jinn kind is Satan. And so Satan is jealous, basically, and arrogant of Adam because God creates Adam. And uh, he basically tells the angels to bow in respect to Adam. And then Satan, who has been like a pious worshiper of God for ages, refuses to bow to Adam uh, out of his arrogance. And he says, why should I bow to Adam? He's made of uh, like soil and earth and I'm made of fire. So I'm superior basically to Adam. 
So he refuses to, to prostrate. And then that's how Satan becomes Satan. Like he, he rebelled against God. And then he wants to basically attack Adam in the garden. And he does this by tricking Adam uh, into eating from the tree um, that God had prohibited him from eating. And that's what causes uh, Adam and his spouse to be exited from paradise and to live mortal lives on earth, basically. Thank you. I didn't know any of that. So that was interesting. All right. Now to some of the questions. Um, that, of course, I'm sure you probably expected it. Does the Quran insinuate that Muslims can kill Christians or or infidels and are infidels Christians? These were like three separate questions that my Twitter followers have had. And again, I promise you none of this will make me angry. It's such a, you know. So, uh, yeah. So it, in the Quran, is it permissible for Muslims to kill Christians? No, absolutely not. There is nothing in the Quran saying that Muslims can just kill people. Um for no reason like that's not in the quran whether it's killing fellow muslims killing non-muslims christian jew hindu there's no license for muslims to kill anyone um so i don't know why people think or claim that this is in the quran there's no verse that's anywhere near that in in the quran like in islam we have the concept of uh war uh so war and this is just like any kind of uh, civilization that you see in history. And it's also in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's uh, within Christianity, the idea of war that you as a civilization or an empire, you will have defensive wars uh, and you'll have offensive wars, wars of conquest. And that's what we see Moses doing actually within um, the Tanakh, where he is uh, leading uh, these kinds of wars of conquest against Canaan, for example. Um, same thing is found in Islam. And but there are certain rules and regulations. It can't just be uh, like this kind of idea that Muslims can just go and kill people and commit terrorism and vigilantism. That's completely uh, prohibited in Islam. So the, these kinds of terror groups, they're violating Islam in, in a very clear-cut way and i'm not like if you know you can tell from what we've said so far i'm not like a sh guy who's sugarcoating islam <laughs> at all so but i can say definitively what uh certain groups do like isis or terror groups that they act in the name of islam they're violating the principles of islam in, in a very clear way because they're acting um because war uh, like wars of conquest require you to have a political authority. You have to have a political authority and there has to be like a reason to uh, conquer land or there has to be a purpose for that. Uh, but to just declare your own jihad and start killing people, this is completely unacceptable in Islam. Okay, and another question that everybody wanted me to ask, um, and I, I, I think I already, I'm already going to know the answer, to be honest, is about Muhammad and him marrying a nine-year-old girl, I think, that everybody kept saying on Twitter. Um, what is your view on that and uh, your view on uh, child marriage or age of consent? I'm just wrapping them all up in one question so I can move past it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this is a common question. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had uh, multiple wives. One of his wives um, he married when uh, basically betrothal, uh, he was arranged to marry her um, with her family, arranging it to get married when she was six. And then the marriage was consummated when she was nine. Um, so this is something that is found in, again, every religion. Uh, especially religions that haven't reformed and they haven't liberalized according to modern liberal standards. Every religion acknowledged marriage being acceptable um, at any age, like bet betrothal. So you have, even within European history, uh, kings who were set to marry, uh, or princes, I should say, a prince that was set to marry a princess when he was just one year old. And she was not even born yet, for example, or that's the bet betrothal. And then when they're, they reach puberty, then that's when marriage is consummated. 
So this is something found in every pre-modern culture and religion. Why? Because people associated uh, marriage with the age of puberty and uh, people hit by bi puberty biologically um, as young as eight years old or nine years old. Uh, even according to current day statistics, about 4% of uh, minors will hit, will have 4% uh, of girls will hit uh, puberty and actually have their period by nine years old. Uh, so this is not something unheard of. And what we see today in, you know, this in the world that we live in, dominated by liberal secularism, that girls are hitting puberty at around those ages and they're immediately getting into fornication because that's the culture. The culture is, you know, that you don't get married when you hit puberty. When you hit puberty, that's the time for dating. That's the time for hooking up. That's the time for this kind of uh, degenerate culture. Um, so the biological tendency doesn't go away just because you have set the age of consent at 18, uh, that people are the, these minors are very sexually active. Um, and the statistics are like 50% or more are sexually active by age 15 in different countries of the West. So the, the sexual activity is happening and it's socially sanctioned. But if you talk about marriage and getting married, then that's suddenly taboo or that's something that is considered to be so strange and bizarre, which I don't understand as a Muslim. I don't see how Christians can accept that either because fornication is uh, one of these mortal sins in both our religions. So this is a kind of contradiction that I see with a lot of Christian culture um, like the modern Christian culture is that you have this practice within your tradition, within Christianity of getting married young, getting married early and, you know, sanctifying a relationship uh, according to the laws of God. Uh, but that's kind of gone away in favor of a libertine degenerate uh, dating culture and you'll have Christians, uh, unfortunately, who are perfectly fine with their, you know, 13 year old daughter going to prom or going to the, you know, these types of dating and being involved sexually. Uh, so this is strange for me as a Muslim. Why is that tolerated? But the idea of marriage, like that's something pure. That's something that is um, that is the that is the God given outlet for the biological drive that we get when we hit puberty so yeah so muhammad salam, peace be upon him that was uh one of his wives he married when she was nine years old um and that's wasn't seen as anything strange or bizarre or immoral it only became immoral when you have this kind of feminist liberal idea that oh no you should delay marriage uh, or marriage before getting your degree is something perverse <laughs> or is something just fornicate, just fornicate, you know, as much as you want, pursue your schooling, go to college, go become like a uh, young professional, but don't even think about marriage. Even now, like people, if you go on Twitter, you have these feminists who are saying that even if you like, if you have a 30 year old, marrying a 18 year old or a 19 year old that's pedophilia <laughs> like that's the standard yeah, so now I, so it's, it's funny because i listen i've been celibate for like 12 years my fiance is a virgin uh we get married i mean so i'm definitely i support purity culture but this might be the only thing that i somebody could ever say i'm liberal on <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know uh people can call it brainwashing or whatever it is but is very uncomfortable for me to even think about uh, somebody that young, that young, that young. Get, well, that young think, okay. So think about this. Uh, let's say you have a daughter and she's, you know, young. Uh, she's in this age of pubescence. She, you might think of her as like this innocent daughter that you have, but she's also hitting puberty. She's going to have these kinds of sexual desires She's going to start being interested in boys. 
she's going to maybe start wanting to talk to boys, start wanting to hang out with boys and be involved with them. Like what would be worse? Would it be worse for her to uh, fall into sin, uh, fall into fornication, or would it be worse for her to find a good husband who's going to, you know, let's say a Christian husband who is going to, uh, their, their relationship is going to be sanctified and she'll be married as a virgin. Which one is, is better for you or which one is, do you consider the worse? Neither. <laughs> no, you got to pick. You got to pick. Neither sound. I can't because they both sound, they both sound, uh, they both sound crazy uh, for me, but I'm not here to debate. But that's, um, but if you look at our previous cultures, like, um, you know, my great grandmother got married when she was 14. I know many Muslims, like the culture has changed and, and shifted, but if you go back one or two generations, it was very common, you know, especially for girls to get married. And that's, that's how you preserve virginity. Like you, you're, you say you value purity culture and your fiance is a virgin. Uh, that's the way that you preserve virginity. Because if you just prolong like the age of where you can get married, then you have to be celibate for like what? Five, six, seven, I've been, I've eight been years. 12. Yeah, but not everyone is, is as strong as you, Bryson. Not everyone can has the self-control that you have. Like for many people, that would be torture. Like that would be years and years of torture. Nah, if you ask anybody that has been celibate for, and I'm not a virgin, by the way, I, I became I became celibate. If you ask anybody that has been celibate for a long time, most people will be like, it may be difficult in the first couple of years because you've had sex before and let's not play. We Everybody knows sex feels good. This is common sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe the first year. But after that, you get so used to it, it, it even boosts your confidence to know that, you know what I'm saying? To know that you're not falling into the, these desires. And, and I think most other people have a similar story. So I'm not special. I don't have some strong type of self-control. Um, I, I think most people, if you can just get past that year, get past that two year, I don't, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that difficult. And you got to keep your, as far as children, I would try to keep my children out of situations because I went to public school. So all we knew was have sex. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, I mean, look at the culture. Like you can't go outside without billboards with sex in, in front of you. You can't like commercials, Instagram, look at social media. Like this is all yeah. like, it's like a pornified culture basically. But, so to, to keep but, yourself from that, like it's tortuous. Like even if you, if you're married, even when you're married, because the temptations don't go away when you're but, married, like it's just surrounding you. Let me and and this is a good time to give people some advice. And I do want to go to the next question, but um, on social media, I want to let y'all know, especially on Instagram, because Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, they literally try to force these half naked women on you. Let me tell you, let me tell you what y'all have to do. There's an actual button, like if you on your for you page and you see like some half naked woman, you can literally click a button, and I am not interested in these type of posts. And the more you hit it, they'll the the algorithm is forced to stop showing it to you. It may come back every once in a while because it's almost like social media is trying to sexualize people. But I promise y'all there's ways around it. The hardest place to get away from it is Twitter because it's just rampant. They don't even care. They don't even try to stop you from watching porn on Twitter. It's like yeah, that stuff should be banned. But even there, he's going to have to unfollow anybody that's even liking that type of stuff, to be honest with you, uh, even, if they, even if they're a friend. But um, the next question is, what is... Mm, I wonder which one should I go to next? Hold on. Let's go to this one. I know a lot of Christians want want to know what is y'all view on the divinity of Jesus. And before I even allow you to answer, people get upset at me because I don't subscribe to certain theologies. Um, so I'm used to certain type of attacks. Uh, so what is the Muslim view or the view in Islam on the divinity of Jesus? Um, we don't believe he's divine. Uh, it's just he's fully human is not divine he's a special human he's a prophet and he's a Mess the messiah so he's special but he's he doesn't have any divinity with uh, you know any divine character or nature or essence um so we don't we don't accept any of that okay also this is the question i wanted to ask right after that conversation also uh as far as marrying multiple women if I'm not mistaken, that is permissible in Islam, but it is discouraged at the same time from, from what I've gathered. Is it discouraged or is it perfectly fine to get married to? For How common is it for a Muslim 
uh, to have multiple wives? Uh, it's not discouraged. The only issue is that it's illegal in some countries. So if it's illegal, then it's it becomes discouraged because we're not supposed to do anything that's illegal that violate, violates the law of the land. Uh, so not encouraging anyone to vi violate the law. But if you're in a Muslim country or the law allows it, then it's not discouraged. It would only be discouraged if you can't provide for additional wives. Um, you can't like because in Islam, the husband has a religious duty, like part of his duties religiously as a husband is to provide for his wife. Um, he has to provide her shelter, food, clothes, uh, basic upkeep and maintenance. So if he's going to get a second wife um, and presumably they're going to have children or not, either way, he has all kinds of costs that he has to maintain her with. If he really can't do it, he can't afford it, then it becomes discouraged for him to take a second wife. But it would be if he didn't have enough money, he couldn't even marry a first wife. Um, that it would be discouraged for him to get married at all because he can't pay for all of this upkeep and maintenance for a wife and kids. So I think that's it's in one of these apologetic type of things to say that it's discouraged in Islam. I don't think it's discouraged at all. Like all things being equal, it could even be uh, encouraged to get a second wife or a third or fourth wife. Uh, my question about that, though, uh, you know. <laughs> I live, I grew up in America, so it could be different in the Middle East, but I don't really think so. Um, women have a sort of emotional nature about them. And mm -hmm. the thing that is very interesting to me is having multiple wives and none of the wives getting jealous or uh, like that. Like, how, how, how would Muslims handle such a thing? I'm good with one woman. Women are too crazy for me to be dealing with multiple. I am perfectly fine with one. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so it's not very common, you know, it's not very common to have a, a man, a Muslim man who has multiple wives, even in the Muslim world in like, you can go to a Muslim country, it's not going to be more than like, 5%. The 5% is probably the ceiling of men who will have multiple wives. Um, but it's jealousy is going to be there. Like, <laughs> you're not going to get past women's nature and so the jealousy is definitely going to be an issue but i feel you like it's not easy it's not going to be something easy to maintain multiple wives but some some guys can do it they're chads i guess they they can man <laughs> they manage that situation that I, explosive situation i only have a few more questions and i do love how you're just answering them straight up i love that i can't stay on ask people questions and they try to give a softball answer even if I disagree, I can always respect um, blunt answers. So a few a few things, you should, should be quick. How do Muslims feel about Jews? Um, like what is the view on, on Jews in, in Islam? Is it negative or what is it? Well, it depends on if you mean Jewish as a religion or Jewish as a race. Um, religion. So religion, so Jewish as a religion is just like other religions we reject, you know, as false, um, other religions, uh, even though we recognize that they're people of the book, you know, along with Christians, they have followed so that that gives them a special status within Islam as people of the book, because they have been given a prior revelation. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the stance on the religion. If you're talking about race, like Jews as a as a race, then we there are many, many of the best Muslims are actually Jews, like they're racially Jewish, they're from a Jewish background, and they converted to Islam. Uh, so you can have like, just like you have an atheist Jew, you can have a Muslim Jew. Uh, so we have a lot of Muslim Jews, and they're usually very um, good practicing Muslims. So yeah, that's the only kind of problem that Muslims would have uh, in this day and age is just the issue of uh zionism and the occupation of palestine like it's a political okay political and how, how do muslims feel about paul and the books of paul or paul as an individual because i know y'all don't believe in the books of paul yeah it seems like paul hijacked christianity like <laughs> to be very honest and blunt uh <laughs> hijacked christianity I, and so so my view is that 
Paul out of context, which the Bible warns about, has taken over Christianity. I think a lot of people have made, uh, my personal view, is a lot of Christians have made an out of context Paul their Jesus rather than Jesus himself. Uh, of course, I, I I believe in the books of Paul, but I believe a lot of Christians uh, take him clearly out of context and make that their gospel. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think Paul came and at the time there were these, what you call like Jewish Christians or, or where they Maybe follow, nice, Nazarenes. yeah, they follow the law. They, they don't just throw away the Mosaic law. Um, so then Pauline Christianity comes and um, magically gets rid of all of that. So I think it, from someone who didn't even meet uh, Jesus, um, you know, unless you believe, take his word for it. So that's, that's my perspective. I think that's the Muslim perspective on Paul, but yeah, that following the law, this is something that, you know, when you say that you, because when it, we talked about uh, polygyny, like multiple wives, we talked about like minor marriage, like these are things that are found in Mosaic law, right? So insofar as you as a uh, law following uh, Torah following Christian, you wouldn't have as big of a problem with those things as like a Pauline Christian, right? I, 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 I do though. <laughs> I, I why do. though? That's why I want to understand. <laughs> we, we, so I don't want to, I don't want to turn it into like a, a debate type thing. So I, like, I, I like having to say consistency with everybody, but sure, I do okay. have a problem with it. Uh, but uh, the next thing is how do, how do Muslims feel about black Muslims or, an, or and how do they feel about the nation of Islam? Are there black Muslims like you know a Sunni yeah. or Shia Muslim? Because that's that's different than the nation of Islam, like Louis Farrakhan. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of uh, black Muslims. According to some estimates, like one fourth, up to one third of Muslims in the U.S. are black. Uh, so, and obviously, we have uh, many African Muslims as well. Um, many African countries are are Muslim majority, Muslim. So that's. Yeah, there's no like issue there. Nation of Islam, they're not Muslim. Like Nation of Islam believes that, you know, God is a man, uh, is like a black man and sent uh, sent the sent Elijah Muhammad as a prophet. Elijah Muhammad is a guy who, from, you know, 80 years ago. So this is this is and white people are are literally the devil <laughs> or the creation of Satan. So this is a completely different theology. It was invented in the 20th century, it has nothing to do with Islam. It just has the name Islam, like Nation of Islam in there. But a lot of people who were in the Nation of Islam become Sunni Muslims, the famous example being Malcolm X. Uh, and even Muhammad Ali, the, the boxer, I believe he was Nation of Islam, and then he became you know, Sunni Muslim. So it becomes like a path like from... Uh, Christianity to um, uh, Nation of Islam to Sunni Islam. You see a lot of that in the past 80 years. Perfect ending to my next question when you brought Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, some of them believe you can't play sports, you can't even play chess, you can't listen to music. Um, and I just find that to be is so interesting. So <laughs> what is your view on that right there? Yeah, Muslims can play sports uh, and be involved with sports. Um, there are some, there will be like certain kinds of requirements. Generally, it's considered to be impermissible to uh, participate in sports where you're going to get harmed. Like if you're going to get beaten to a pulp, boxing. Then, yeah, like boxing. Like that's considered something to uh, violate Islamic law. Um, but I mean, so someone who is, is doing that would be considered sinful. That doesn't mean, you, so Muslims love Muhammad Ali, uh, but they love him because of all, like what he represented, the values that he stood for being a principled man, uh, throughout his life. Uh, he has met, had many amazing virtues and is a role model, but specifically boxing, like, is that something that is condoned in Islam? No. Because it's it causes damage. It cause, you're harming yourself potentially per permanently, you know, by getting uh, punched in the face repeatedly. 
So that's, that's the general stance on, on boxing, but sports in general, like I, I play a lot of basketball. Uh, I, I do weightlifting, like those kinds of sports. There's no issue. You're not going to damage yourself. Uh, you're gonna, it's encouraged to take care of your health and to exercise and to even excel at certain sports. Like my kids do jujitsu. Like that's, that's the sport, but that's a, that's a combat sport that doesn't involve like strikes to the face. You could practice boxing if you're just doing it for conditioning, like you practice on a bag and you're not actually going and like hitting someone in the face and getting hit yourself, then that's, that's perfectly fine. Islamically too. How about music? Yeah. Music is, can, is impermissible as well in, in Islam. Yeah. Well, so y'all can't listen to no music, bro. <laughs> Bask. Yeah. Is it, so here go my thing with that. If I'm not mistaken, I researched this before. I don't think it says that in the Quran, though, that music is impermissible. So why why would it be impermissible in the religion? Well, the source of the religion is the Quran, and it's also uh, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So his example is called the Sunnah. And so it's not it's his statements, his actions and things that he approved of in his life. So there are mo multiple statements of the Prophet Sallallahu the peace be upon him, warning against the dangers of music and how it has this corrupting influence, how it's tied to Satanism. It, it basically is something that distracts from God. It's something that it enters the heart and it, it has this kind of impact on a person's heart where like you're a song gets stuck in your head or you some people like they listen to so much music that it just takes over their lives and they can't like sit for a minute without something playing music. Like I had a roommate in college or a suite mate in college. He couldn't go to sleep unless there was music playing in the background. Like that's the level that it reached to. And the idea is that music becomes like this influence on your heart and your heart gets filled with music so much that there's no room for remembering God. There's no room for that piety to, to God. So that's like in principle, what is wrong with music? And then you add like the cultural factor. I don't need to tell, to tell you that there's a lot of degeneracy that's pushed through music. Music can become like this tool of Satan. And I know that you're, you try to, with your own work, you try to combat that, but like, so that's why I try to give you both sides, like the principled answer, like in principle, even like with Mozart, like what's wrong with Mozart, what's wrong with like Bach or Beethoven, like even that it can take over the soul. And there's something like uh, special about music that it has this effect on the soul that can be corrosive. So. Okay. And, um, I think two more questions. Uh, one is um, I'm going to pick multiple questions in one. So just bear with me. Um, what is the, one of them? I think we all know. What is the view in Islam about homosexuality? And can there be a gay Muslim? Um, also, what is the name? Just quickly. What is the name of a, of a leader of a mosque? What is the correct terminology to use? The correct terminology is Imam. Okay. Yeah. Imam. So, can there be a female imam? Yeah, so there's so there, there are two questions. Right there. <laughs> yeah, those are good questions. Yeah, so you can't have a female imam. You can't have a female who lead because the imam has to lead prayers, and uh, imam is not the same as like anyone can be an imam who knows how to pray and knows like the rules of like purity, like because you have to um, wash yourself before you pray. Uh, five times a day it's called uh, wudu and so someone who leads the prayer has to have like a minimum amount of knowledge about like pure purification how to pray how to how to correctly read the quran so if you meet those requirements you can lead prayer like uh, and be an imam most of the major mosques will have like an official imam but if the imam for some reason is like he's sick one day Anyone from the congregation who meets those requirements of being able to recite the Quran properly can go and stand and be the, the imam for that particular prayer. Uh, so that's uh, imam, as, but it can't be a woman. Like a, a woman cannot lead, lead the prayer. Um, but when it comes to homosexuality, it's something that's completely forbidden. It's one of the uh, greatest uh, sins 
um, the homosexual act uh, between two men or two women. Um, and it's something that is you know, has a criminal punishment in Islamic law, just like adultery or fornication have criminal punishments, homosexuality, homosexual acts as well, um, have that. Uh, and what else? Can there uh, be a gay, like, is there such thing as a gay Muslim? Yeah, there would be a, you, being gay doesn't take you out of Islam. You would just be a sinful, like, you'd be a sinful Muslim um, if you called yourself a gay Muslim. Yeah, and if you act on like just like if you you can be a muslim and be a criminal like you can be a muslim and be a drug addict you can be a muslim and become be you know um even a killer like a murderer you can be a muslim but you're just sinful same thing with like being a gay muslim okay and just to end it off on some salt uh but people did ask this question what is your favorite i mean it's kind of a cheesy question i hate these type of questions but whatever what is your favorite thing about being a muslim but what is the most challenging thing uh about being a muslim also mm, that's a good question the best thing is you just i you feel like you are doing what you're meant to be doing as a human being like the idea of submitting to god submitting to your creator um it just feels so right and it, you feel complete uh, by that. We're created as human beings to worship God, uh, to worship our creator. And that's, as a Muslim, like that's what it means to be a Muslim, to submit to your creator, to submit to Allah. Um, so that's the best part of being a Muslim. You're just focused on Allah, like you're, all of your love is directed to Allah, to your creator, and you submit to him and you have hope um, in him that he'll forgive you. And then you also have fear. Like when you really submit to something and you love that, you also have that sense of fear. Like, oh, what if I do something wrong? Or what if I, you know, do something to disappoint uh, my beloved creator? So that's the kind of loving relationship that I really enjoy about being a Muslim is striving to be a, a true servant and submitter to uh, Allah, to God Almighty. That's that's the best thing. The, the challenge, I would say, is we live in a, in a world that's increasingly hostile to God and increasingly hostile to the idea of religion. So it's challenging to live in, in a world like this that's you know increasingly liberalized, secularized, and we, you know, you try your best, but I'd say that's definitely the biggest challenge. Yo, them are all the questions I have. Hope that I didn't miss any. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, answering them. I know it's been a little bit over an hour, so I do, I do apologize. But again, uh, thank you so much for answering the questions. Uh, thank you for coming on on such short notice. I've been actually looking for a Muslim to talk to for at least six months. Uh, so thank you so much, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for all your questions. I really enjoyed. I didn't get to ask you any questions, though, because I want to I wasn't sure like exactly your views on, you know, like the divinity of Jesus. And I got a sense of what you think about Paul, <laughs> but other yeah. issues would have so, been good to. So the, the definition of divinity uh, or divine is of God, from God or God himself. Uh, so I do believe Jesus fit the definition. Uh, since I'm a Christian, I believe he is the son of God, um, the only begotten son of God. So I do believe he's fit the, he fits the definition of the vine, but I also think he's sub, uh, subordinate to the father because he literally said so. Uh, as, as as far as Paul, like I said, I believe in Paul, but the, I think the issue with, with Paul is not Paul himself is uh, a lot of Christians, you know, Christians are the most Christians. Christians are not as knowledgeable about the our own Bible than Jews and atheists. Atheists and Jews know our Bible more than we do. And I think uh, that's what makes Paul sort of a stumbling block for Christians. And people people use Paul to argue against Jesus all the time. And I think that is just the craziest thing I can ever think of in my life. Um, but, uh, but, but, but yeah, I'm very kind. A lot of Christians hate me. You can find videos all over the internet. Um, I'm mean, off the rip. I keep Torah. I keep, I keep the law. I eat clean, um, biblically clean. Um, you, I think the like law, you eat kosher? 
Uh, yeah, I don't even like the word kosher. That's not really a biblical word. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. in kosher, you can't eat a cheeseburger, but the Bible verse they try to pull that from has no like it makes zero sense. Um, so kosher is more of a, a, a I do buy stuff that's that's more kosher, but like. It's something about like the 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 baby the, the goat being in the baby's milk, and they say that means you can't eat a cheeseburger. It just doesn't make any logical sense. Yeah. That's more like tradition of man versus that's more Talmudic in my opinion. Um, so I eat cheeseburgers, but I don't eat pork. I don't eat shellfish. I like anything the Bible says is unclean. I don't eat it. Uh, you know what I'm saying. So I mean, you can call it kosher just to make it you know what I'm saying quick and easy. So yeah, I I, I do all that. I keep Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night. Um. Is that your family days. or did this is something you chose like uh, later now, I, in life? I grew up a, a regular Christian. I believed in any, everything most Christians believed in. Um, and the issue is when I was younger in the Bible, I had a heavy focus on the New Testament. Then I thought about it. I said, nobody watches movies from the end. No, Like you don't start a movie at the end. You, you don't listen to a song from the end and then rewind it. You know, it just doesn't make sense to do it. So I read the Bible from front to back and it gives you an entire, just a different, perspective you like oh everything i've pretty much been taught has been like ludicrous uh that's why a lot of churches literally give you the new testament without the old testament in it which is kind of weird because mm-hmm. all paul all jesus all they did was quote the tanakh and so to act like you can understand them without understanding what they're quoting just makes no logical sense um so that, that's why i came to be I, I really became full circle in that like two years ago or something or something like that like I've always made sure, you know what I'm saying, I stopped doing certain things. Um but when I when I became like fully in the Torah, things became way different. How many are there like uh who have the same beliefs as you like in the US or in the world? I don't I, I don't think there's many. It is growing right now. Uh it it is growing a lot, but I don't think there's many because you, you you have to. Re- well, I don't want to get too deep into history, but we were pe- people like me were killed and murdered in the first century. Mm. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, so uh, you know, uh, it, it is growing though. A lot of a lot of people are coming into, you know, what I'm saying, um, keeping the Sabbath and 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 going back to, uh, going back to God, keeping the commandments. A lot of people are going back to it, but it gets discouraged. Like if I post Shabbat Shalom on Twitter, um, me and you follow each other now, so you will see it. Like all I do is post Shabbat Shalom when it's Shabbat. You know what I'm saying? And then a bunch of people would be like, Jew, Jew, Judaizer, you know. It's, <laughs> you know, you know. And I find it funny because I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying it on my page. Um, so I think it, I think a lot of people are dis, uh, are discouraged from doing it because, you know, people are afraid to be attacked like that. But me, I don't yeah. care. Yeah. Well, do you have like a community locally or it's just online? Uh, there is, there is a church I go to. Um, there, there, there's a church I go to locally. My, my only issue on something that me and you would really disagree on is I, I, I don't believe everybody is a sinner. I, uh, my Bible it preaches clearly against that. Um, there is something called an unintentional sin in Leviticus four, but but most Christians don't even believe you can sin unintentionally, which is weird because it's right there in the Bible, like literally right there. Leviticus four literally says unintentional sin. Like you can't, you can't, you can't interpret it no different way. Uh, but the Bible also says if you willfully sin after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sin. It said uh, uh, in, in 1 John 3, it actually says you can be just as righteous as Jesus is righteous. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus himself says, be perfect as my father in heaven is perfect. And that's just him quoting the dozens of times in the Torah where God says, be holy as I am holy. Um, so I, I I don't believe sin is unavoidable. Um, I, and and my issue with a local community is I, me personally, I don't want to be around a bunch of people that identify with being a sinner because if you already have an excuse to sin, if you already have a, if you already have like a, you know, a reason why you can sin, then of course you're going to continue and stay in sin. You're not going to never be truly in, re- in repentance because you already have an excuse. So like if I go watch porn right now, me, even me, I could get on Twitter right after I watch porn and be like, y'all, I fail, but because of God's grace, um, I just repented again and I know Jesus and everybody like, oh, it's okay, Bryson. So, you know, okay. So now I know my, like, I feel like the mental psychology state comes into play. So it's like, oh, so every time I watch porn, I can just say that that's cool. You know? And instead I haven't watched porn in years. I haven't had sex in years. I stopped listening to secular music in 2020. I have listened to it since I, uh, I mean, I'm very faithful to my fiance. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
I stopped cursing in 2020. Haven't said a curse word since. Uh, you know, so a lot, a, a lot of things I think from my personal experience and experience of people that I that I call my friends. So I think a lot of things like my friend Tyson James was a drug addict and he stopped taking drugs. You know, what I'm saying? so mm -hmm. so I, I just don't think it is. I don't think you have to sin. Yeah, that's really uh, praiseworthy. You know, the, your commitment to not sinning and. It's something that we don't see much of these days, unfortunately, like people are not really committed to God or they don't take it seriously. I think this is a big problem uh, with the world overall. And it's really nice to see a Christian who, you know, really wants to commit himself to God. And I feel a lot of, you know, goodwill towards Christians like that. Thank you. I mean, listen, I want to go to heaven, bro. Like call it, call it, call it selfish. But uh, I believe in God, and to believe in God, you have to believe in uh, heaven, or <laughs> and you have to believe in hell at the same time. And you know the way the Bible describes hell, I just don't want to be there. Uh, and the Bible explains to you how you are judged, just like in Islam, it's, it's by faith and by deeds. And me, bro, I I, I actually seriously want to <laughs> want to go to heaven, so so I can't joke. I can't joke about stuff like that, man. But. Yeah, man, it, this was cool. If you ever want me on like any show of yours, do you, do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, the Muslim Skeptic is my YouTube channel. Okay, okay, awesome. So, I'm gonna tag, I'm gonna tag mm -hmm. your YouTube channel when I post this. I'm gonna try to get it up tomorrow because mm -hmm. I have to go to Austin, Texas, um, this weekend. Yeah, yeah, um, it was great talking to you. And yeah, I, I just say like look into the life of the Prophet Muhammad and peace be upon him because you'll see all those parallels with the life of moses and the message of moses so that's really the i think and and reading the quran like if you read the quran read about the prophet muhammad you know just as for your own edification so you know more about it um you know that's obviously i'm inviting everyone all christians i would love christians to become muslim i'd love you for you to become a muslim and you know follow the quran and and you'll see you know the parallels there between the torah and the quran but yeah just wanted to put that out there as well oh, oh, it's your job to do so <laughs> sir it's your job to do so for you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on man thank you bryson thank you yes, so sir. much yes sir you too